Welcome to Revenue Talks, the show where we get real about what it takes to build pipeline and drive expansion as a go-to-market team. I'm Justin Keller, the Vice President of Revenue Marketing at Drift, and on this show, I'm here talking to folks across the entire go-to-market organization, which means marketing, sales, and customer success, about how they use conversations, technology, and cross-functional alignment to build more pipeline and drive expansion. Because revenue, it's everyone's business now. Hey, everyone, we're back. It's Justin. This is Revenue Talks, and welcome to Season 2. I'm very excited to be joined by Armin Ziljin. Let's go. Super excited. Okay. On today's episode, we're going to take a look into the customer success side of revenue acceleration. We are joined by the one and only Jess Moschino, who is the SVP of Customer Services at Workable, which is one of the world's leading talent acquisition solutions. And Jess has been involved in customer success since the dawn of her career. So in this episode, we're going to walk through what she learned about staying cross-functional in all of those key areas. All right. So um, let's get into it. Jess, thank you so much for joining us. You are the very first guest we're having on this season of Revenue Talks. Um, And so I want to start the season off with a juicy topic. That's right. You are a lobster, right? Like, or a lobster, a lobster person. What do you? What is the term for? <laughs> yeah, we, First question, yeah, we were arguing over for someone who lobsters. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so it would be a lobster fisher or a fisherman. Lobster fisher. Lobster so you're fisherman. Close. Okay. Okay. I love this so much, um, and I want to know what are the parallels? What can we? What can we as business people learn um, from the fisher, the lobster fisher person experience, or vice versa? What can business tell us about lobstering? Absolutely. I think there are a lot of parallels, actually. So when you think about it in the lobster industry, it's a matter of going out and looking at what you've done the year before. So hitting similar spots, looking to see what the migratory patterns are, trying to assess bait, try to figure out you know, how to get the most with obviously the least amount of operational costs. And so if you're able to do it really effectively, it's so fun when the lobsters come up in the trap. It's no different when you have a customer retain or when you have a customer grow, right? So it's really about stopping and looking at analytics and thinking about, again, how you've done things before, how you can do it more effectively. And then again, what is that value mix, right? How do you get those lobsters into the trap? Is it redfish? Is it another mix of bait? So for customer success, it's really thinking about, you know, not to equate them to lobsters, but our customers, what's going to get them excited so that they keep coming back? And then if you do it right, you can do it again at hopefully a reasonable price point, reasonable resources. And, it, it, you know, again, it's exciting when they when they stay with you. Okay. I love this. Um, to be clear, we're not calling anyone lobsters here, but let's no, say, <laughs> you know, I have to imagine as you're lobstering, there are environmental factors that are outside your control right that are going to influence what you're pulling up what do you do and then and does this hold true what do you do in that situation like when you have to kind of start from start from scratch almost does that feel the same in business it does i mean you get to certain points where it doesn't make financial sense to go out and do something a certain way you have to stop and reassess so how are we going about the problem how can we do it again more effectively um, and you do have to stop and be willing to make those changes. It's it's not something where you shift everything, but how can you work smarter, not harder, right? And how can you really think about, you know, the overall end goals and keep that in mind over the course of a lobster season or over the course of a, the life cycle of a customer? So same idea. All right. We're we're starting the season off with a bang. Like I love that we're, we're, we're Every every episode, Armin, we have to work out some kind of new business metaphor, and lobsters I, is a high bar to start with. I think we should stay on the food to to software metaphor because I'm down yeah. with that. Okay. <laughs> I can hook you guys up. That's for yeah, sure. Yeah, seriously, seriously. Hey, so so listen, focusing on your time at Workable, you've had, like I said, different roles from VP of Customer Success, VP of Account Management. Um, senior vice president of customer service. And there's like all kinds of metrics, whether it's health, retention, expansion associated with that. Three different teams trying to create one experience for a customer from different angles. I'd love to hear like how you jumped from each role. And then maybe we can jump into like how they're intertwined and aligned. 
Yeah, no, absolutely happy to do that. So when I started at Workable, I came in to head up customer success. And at that point, in, in every company, customer success means something a little bit different. Totally. There are different yeah. responsibilities. So at Workable at that time, it was more of an onboarding team. And they would get the customer to a healthy place, transition them over to account management, which account management would look to see how lucrative the opportunity was, how healthy the customer is using health scoring and think about when to reach out. And we lost so much in translation, right? So when you stop and think about it, that key moment is when you onboard. That great mm -hmm. experience kicks off and keeps going. And so I want to say it was about three months in, we stopped and said, wait, for the price point for the customer, for the experience we're providing, let's just merge customer success and account management. And that's really how that happened, right? So trying to think about, you know, how do you not lose all of that goodness from each of those customer milestones? So onboarding or as they roll out to their teams or, you know, whatever the next step might be all the way through our milestones. And so that's how we, how we managed it. So the metrics are different, right? So it's CSAT and it's looking at MPS as they go through the initial onboarding. And then it's looking at adoption and usage and, you know, the, the KPIs that they had coming in, are we meeting them? And then as you go on, so last year I took over all of the customer facing teams. It's really stopping and looking at start to finish. How many touches do we have? What makes sense? And, Again, from the customer's perspective, does it feel like it's disjointed anywhere? And if so, how do we iron that out? Um, and that's really been what we've been focused on. What governs what governs the changes that you make? So merging customer success with account management, is that like, as you said, thinking about like the number of handoffs and the number of people? Is it the unit economics of what you yield out of a customer? and Or is it purely on the cu the customer facing side like listen we're going to have a better experience that that in turns into increased adoption if we could develop like a relationship that we maintain throughout the product like what was what was that governing factor there yeah i think it's a bit of all three so at the time it was a matter of we wanted, when I came in, my task was to look at the customer journey, right? And to think about all of the places that we could provide more value, all the places that we we're leaving a customer to, you know, get lost along their journey. And so it is thinking about also unit economics. How much are the contract values versus how many people we have touching them? And then again, you know, along that stage, we're almost over servicing them, but at a detriment, right? It's not actually meeting our goals or their goals. And so when we looked at it, we had too many people. It didn't make sense based on size of contracts. The customer knowledge was getting lost, even having a CRM, right? Even having, at that time, we're using Salesforce. Now we use um, Turn Zero and Salesforce. Um, but really thinking about, you know, how do we make the most of those engagements? They should be meaningful. And how do we also look at how customers want to be serviced, because our smaller customers might not want a big service experience, but our customers that have a lot of different locations and, you know, we're an ATS, so hiring mm -hmm. managers, recruiters, how do we make sure they get the right experience and everybody has that same goal and, and we're aware of it and can help them. So we just weren't getting it done having the two disparate teams. Yeah. Um, yeah. It felt like it, but then you kept bumping into each other, right? right? So then it's, did you handle that issue? I've got that issue. Did you renew the customer? Whose fault is it if it doesn't renew? We also were able to put a single point of accountability, right? Which makes yeah. a difference. And I have to imagine, like, that helps. I think all these metrics are great, but there's one that's kind of intangible, and that's, like, the relationship and the value mm -hmm. of that that I think is... Mm -hmm. Important. So like brand market, like, you know, a marketer, like brand is something that's hard to measure, but lifts all the other metrics if it's done well. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like that's something like a byproduct that's been helpful by unifying that? Absolutely. I think, again, we weren't doing ourselves a service or the customer would onboard. The customer would feel comfortable and confident. Then they'd go to the account manager and the account management team is doing a great job, but they still don't have that knowledge or have gained that trust. And then it comes time for renewal who yeah. handles that. Do you bring sales back in? So it really became, again, you can't do it with every situation. You know, we've actually, we've broken out of it a little bit at this stage um, with some of our accounts and treat them a little differently. But I think it does make sense to really take a look at, you know, those touch points, the relationship. Does a customer know where to go? How do you automate some of that? Because if you think about it, like the one-to-one -one relationship that you want to replicate all the time is just not tenable in, in in a lot of cases. 
And so what's the what are the one to many strategies that you use as you learn based on the one to one relationships that work? How do you turn that into like systems that help overall customer value and engagement? Yeah, it's a great question. So we've actually done a lot of searching on this. Um, again, we broke out of our own mold this past year. We're doing a lot more self-service sales in addition to sales assisted, right? It's a lot of product-led sales. Um, and really taking a look at, you know, does it make sense for us to look at the onboarding and have a separate health score? Do some automation where we have a product that's very easy for a customer to get up and running on their own. And there are basically flags and plays when somebody goes off schedule or when something happens we don't expect. And then we can do some proactive touch on those. Um, for the bigger accounts, we're spending much more time. It's a one-on-one -on -one experience. But you're right. You can't do it with everybody. And you don't want to. No. You really don't want to. Yeah. So um, that scalable tech touch helps. We have a customer enablement group that puts out great collateral. We're doing a lot with video. That helps a lot as well. So... Justin, on the marketing side, like being able to put that front and center on the website and direct people to it. Um, or we have, um, you know, in-app chat and forethought and the ability to get some quick answers to folks. So, Interrupting this episode of Revenue Talks to let you know that Drift has been named a leader in the Forrester New Wave Conversation Automation Solutions Q3 2022 report. This report consists of detailed findings from Forrester and how a vendor is scored against 10 specific criteria, as well as where they stand in relation with one another. We're thrilled to be included amongst such a stacked group. To learn more about this recognition, click the link in the show notes. Jumping in a little bit more specifically on relationships, there's one relationship handoff that you that probably you don't merge and that's between sales and and then the post sale team right yeah i love the smile because i you know where yeah. i'm going um so uh, <laughs> it's I've inevitable been, i've been on both sides of it i've been on the receiving end and the giving end and and uh, uh probably screwed it up on both places for sure uh but the, listen the relationship between sales and and post sale is super important to make seamless the uh, the experience for the customer especially around like expectation setting and so how do you guys uh, align with sales how do you get that really good handoff that's that's kind of mandatory you're not going to get around that handoff uh and customers hate handoffs so how do you make it as yeah. seamless as possible yeah so for the the smaller accounts for self serve self purchase um for them it's much easier because they're in they're in the product and we're sending a lot of communication so we, they know where to go for our sales assisted we're doing a couple of things so we use a CRM solution They'll enter their notes. They'll include things like they'll enter challenges their throughout notes. sale. They'll enter their notes? Seriously? Your sales <laughs> reps do that? Are you being we truthful do. here or not? I want to know. Do. Yes. Yes. No. Can we do that too? We yes. do. I'm working on it. <laughs> That's, it's a mandatory field to be able to create To close quote. it out. That's the trick. Well, sometimes trick. even when it's mandatory, though, they will, and I'm being serious, like they'll just fluff yeah. it, right, to just get it done yeah. so they can get their commission, right? And I've been, like yes. I said, I've been on this side too, so I'm not criticize i get it how do you make yeah. sure that it's meaning again meaningful like how do you really like yeah, work with so the sales I, leaders in that area there's a couple things so number one any d books that happen within first year count against the salesperson got it okay so they don't want that to happen. Like, so the long-term goal is they don't want to claw back they want to make yep. sure it's the right deal i think as well our leadership comes together really well to identify what our you know, ideal customer profile is who we mm -hmm. should be selling to, how it is that we're able to retain customers or when we're not able to so that they know what a challenging deal might look like. So and then at that front, there, there is a lot of communication back and forth. Mm -hmm. And for the bigger deals, mm -hmm. we'll actually do a handoff call with the customer. It's their introduction to the actual. So the, the rep the, will do a co co call with yeah. the customer and the CS or, or and they, sale. they're on for five minutes. We try not to take too much time. It's just jump on for five. We'll finish the rest of the call. Okay. Um, but for like mid-sized companies, we're really relying on the feedback they're sharing. Mm -hmm. um, we also do a post-sale survey that we have access to the to the responses. So if the customer feels like something happened along the way. They can share that. Um, so we do keep in touch with customers pretty regularly. Yeah. Uh, one thing that we've run into in the past is like we'll set the notes and the tone about the post sale and what they want to achieve. As as new folks after the initial sale 
uh, happens, new folks get involved on the customer side, they might bring up new projects that they want to apply to the to the to the software. And somehow we might like they rediscover the account and like maybe take it a little bit off track. And then there's a misalignment from maybe executives who are involved in the initial sale. Do you see that? And how do you mitigate that? We don't see it too much. Every once in a while, it'll pop up. And at that point, we get on the phone, the customer, the account executive and the the account manager, or it'll be somebody from the leadership team that mm -hmm. will get on and say, okay, here's the structure of what you purchased. Understanding now, here's what you'd like to get to. Here's how we can, you know, do an administrative debook and rebook and, and make sure we've got the right things together. Got it. Oftentimes though, it happens further down when they've gone through onboarding and they're like, wait, this isn't what I thought it should be. In that situation, we'll have a, we'll have a solutions consultant join a call and just see if we're able to, to mitigate it on our own and not pull sales back in. Right. Um, right. We don't do like an us versus them. We very much try to keep them selling. We try to keep our team, you know, focused and, our product is pretty pretty easy to navigate, so it's 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 kind of tough to screw up those those deals too bad, which is good, right? Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> yeah. How you, Jess, you talked a little bit about. First of all, thank you on behalf of Workable's marketing team and marketers everywhere. Thank you for hooking them up with uh, customer videos and giving them yeah. customer feedback for the website. How does marketing fit in the mix here, though? Like, are yeah. are they helping you at all? Do they plug into like support your team, or is it just you guys? close that loop and send it back to marketing? It's actually, it's a pretty cool cycle. We interact in a couple ways. So for sure, we send them information in terms of product feedback or what we're seeing or where we're challenged. That happens. We also have a regular call where I can hear each week how many you know, MQLs and SQLs, like how many leads they're passing forward, where they're challenged, what to expect. So that helps me as I think about pipeline for what I'm going to need to get the team involved with for onboarding and such. Um, and then we also have quite a bit of conversation around um, some of the campaigns that we run. So we try to have the same tone across Workable. That's so important for customers to hear the same language, same tone. It's us. It's our brand. We're very casual um, and so we'll try to build campaigns. We'll send it over to them. Um, we'll see also like it's the market's tough right now, right? Not every industry is, is doing as well as others. So where is the sales team having good luck? Where is the marketing team having luck with their, um, they're in charge of our SDR team. So they'll give us some guidance and direction too, along with building out some campaigns. So got it. Yeah, that's I, so I actually worked at an ATS for a while as a head of marketing at a, um, an ATS. And you're exactly right. Like it was the market was so tempestuous that it was like every day we were heading in a different direction and we had to change kind of our industry focus. And what was our value prop to them? And that's great that you're able to kind of help close that loop with them, because it's really hard for a marketer to constantly be retraining their guns on a new on a new yeah. audience. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think the other thing that helps is we have access to the same product feedback. So whether it comes from a closed loss deal, whether it comes from a survey that someone's completed post-sale or our customers that are talking to the, to the account management or support teams, all three leaders, so marketing sales and myself, see that feedback and can act on it. And we meet on the regular too. So that's amazing. Um, and I feel like that's got to drive really good alignment. And I think that's probably one of the biggest, I mean, just simply communicating is it solves so many things. Yeah. But I think there are, there are always, and this is probably different at every organization, but I think there's probably a few in common. Like, what do you think for the people listening to this, the biggest challenges or most common obstacles that prevent that alignment are? I think sometimes it's competing priorities, right? So sometimes, I mean, even in this market, you know, I talked to the head of sales a couple um, a couple days ago. We meet once a week. We go through open deals and what might close. And there are a few that you just know are not retainable, right? And so I'm having the conversation. They're saying, hey, we've got a number to hit. Help us out. We'll be able to do it. Can you... So, I mean, it, it's, you know, sometimes there are competing priorities and that's a challenge for sure. How do you guys draw the line? How do you guys get How do you get agreement on like, we're, we're either going to take this one on or we're not going to take this one on? Usually we're able to do it just through conversation. So I mm -hmm. think we have a pretty 
good relationship that we can get on the phone and say, look, here's the risk I see for this. And Mm -hmm. most of our accounts are one-year contracts. Mm -hmm. So if it looks like an implementation is going to take more than a month or two months, there's not enough value there to sustain and it puts everything at risk. So typically we're able to just say, you know, this, this is the experience they're going to have. You need to know about that. And if they debug that first year again, you know, from a, from we don't pra- want word of mouth either. No, no. Cause it'll yeah. just, it hurts your brand. So how do you, yeah. what, what, from a practical perspective, how do you get visibility to either strong or weak thing? Are you guys doing pipeline analysis? Are you looking at the pipeline and saying, Hey, red flag here, red flag there. Yeah. So we do um, what's called a revenue pulse once a week. So we meet with all of the executives in a room, all the commercial Mm -hmm. team plus our C-level. So we do that once a week. Um, What that does, it it does a couple of things. One, I can see their forecast. They can see my forecast for net recurring revenue and for gross retention. And we actually do our own upgrades. They can see that too. Um, for their side, I can see their closed loss deals, why they lost them. So we go through globally what happened, like the top 10. Mm-hmm. I can see what's in their pipe for the top 10 for the Americas and, and rest of the world. And then I can see what recently closed, whatever they won. So that's really the best way that I can see. There's reporting I can go into, but we're all adults. I don't spend time going through and worrying too much about that. I think, you know, if there's a red flag, they're pretty good about bringing it to that meeting to say, look, this might be contentious. This might be an issue. How do you want to handle it? And we'll talk it out. So I think that open line of communication and trust is that makes a difference. And the venue. I think that I love that you've got that revenue pulse thing where it is cross-functional and you've got like the C-suite to, you know, kind of force that alignment and that yeah. downward pressure, which great, right? So accountability, communication, and then like just kind of whether it's the venue or the process or the you know programming of it, but making sure that happens. Yeah. And sometimes like it solves those obstacles. It goes off sometimes, right? Sometimes somebody will sell something or do something and you're, you know, under your breath swearing or whatever, you know, but um, <laughs> we solve it. It happens. Um, we're all human, but Does I think the sales we do rep when you're talking yeah. about know who they are. That's what I want to know. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> His ears are ringing right now. The phone will ring. He knows. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so listen, we did our research. Don't be scared, but we did do our research uh-uh. in LinkedIn. Uh, 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 and one of the recommendations from your direct reports wrote um, that you ensure everyone understands the common goal as a team. And so like as, as you think about, as Justin said, there's lots of competing priorities. There's other influences and some pressures in the business. Um, rates are going up or down in different areas, whether it's revenue, retention, expansion. So those priorities are driven. How do you not whipsaw uh, the team? How do you uh, kind of insulate them from the noise and make sure people stay aligned with what's the most important thing to the business? Yeah, that's a great question. So it's, again, we're in ATS. So we've had two years of COVID. Then we had the boom of sure. everybody hiring. <laughs> now we've got this crazy market and whatever's going on in Russia and God knows, right? So I think for us in the past, we've been able to do it. We've rolled out, I think one of the strongest things is a clear compensation plan. And I know it sounds silly, but it really does make a huge difference. So we used to be able to do them annually and then COVID hit and Mm. the crazy market and whatever else. So what we do is actually get our vision and mission from our our C-level. So we have an all-hands meeting that happens every quarter. We have our company targets that are outlined very clearly. Anyone can find them. And then our comp plan directly ties into that. And you can actually do the math to see how that's going to get there. So if we miss a number, here's what that means for our year over year growth or rule of 40. Here's, you know, our operational stuff. And so we meet with the team on a monthly basis to actually, you know, we don't dumb it down. We give them the numbers. We don't spend a lot of time on it. Here's what it is. Here's what we're tracking against. Managers do one-on-one so they can see, you know, how to help them get to what they need to get to. And I think if they're able to draw that line themselves, it, it makes it much easier. And then in terms of the the white noise stuff, I mean, that that's tough. I mean, we do as much fun activities as we can, like, you know, calling power hours and locking people in a room with music and just do your stuff and have fun or, you know, if it's an event or something. And, and I think we don't take ourselves too seriously. We celebrate when we win and we don't kill each other when we lose, which 
I think so, that's so important. It's so easy to take yeah. yourself seriously here. Yeah. Here. Yeah. And finding that moment, like, I think that helps the communication and the trust, right? Like just not taking yourself seriously is the antidote to that. Yeah. And it's just open dialogue. So in our one-on-ones, we've got a pretty good, you know, breakout of what we want to cover, but it's also a lot about like what's on the employee's mind and letting them talk for the first 15 and and kind of break out what, because people are concerned about what's going on and you don't know what's going on in their personal lives. So let them kind of, that's their time, let them have it. And then, you know, just tie to what you're trying to achieve. Yeah. And that's something I heard from you multiple times in the past half an hour is, you know, like we're humans and treating people like humans that are responsible, have lives, have feelings, um, whether it's your clients or your teammates is pretty critical to success. Yeah. Yeah. And they have to see that you're willing to get in there with them. So when we've gone through challenging times, it's not like there's somebody up here screaming, go do these five things. I mean, I took on a client territory the first quarter of the year. Like we do, you do what you have to do. So love that. Jess, this has been awesome. Um, we've got a tradition here. We always close these things off with the signature revenue talks question. And that is this. What yes. is the number one thing your team is focused on to accelerate revenue in the second half of the year? Bonus points if it involves lobsters. Definitely. <laughs> and butter. It, <laughs> if it's straight off the boat, you don't need butter. That's the secret. If it's right off the boat, it's sweet. Um, I wonder what the business analogy for that is. <laughs> right. Right. You don't have to sweeten the deal if you can get it done quick. Um, there, there it is. There it is. No, the, I'd say the number one thing for us is increasing our communication and improving our communication style. And it's actually towards driving um, our GRR. So our, our gross revenue retention, that's our focus for the second half. So everything else, like we've got, we've got a great team that can drive growth and can find upgrade opportunities, but we've learned through our health scoring and just doing some additional analytics that customers that we talk to on the regular for the most part, and not everybody, um, tend not to churn. So for us, our focus really is trying to have better, more meaningful conversations, EBRs, things like that. I appreciate your time so much, Jess. Uh, Jess Moschino, everybody from Workable, thank you for joining us. Welcome back to Revenue Talk Season 2 featuring the one and only Armin Zildjian. Yeah. I'm Justin Keller. Thank you so much for listening to Revenue Talks. If you liked this episode, please consider leaving a review wherever you're listening. You can connect with me on Twitter at Justin Keller and the entire Drift Podcast Network at, at Drift Podcasts. Remember, Revenue, it's everyone's business now. 